walking into the home burglars. I like to consider myself a very cautious individual. I never answer the phone if I don't recognize the number, and I'll never open the front door without first checking through the peephole. While listening to scary stories on YouTube, mainly from you, the creepy fox, has helped me in assuring these precautions. I wasn't always this way. I, like so many others when they were younger, were a lot more oblivious to the true nature of the real world. To think, you could be going about your daily life, going to school, going to work. You don't even think that later that day, you might have something occur that's so frightening, so scary, that it forever changes who you are. With that little intro out of the way, I want to take you back with me to about 2002. I was a junior in high school, and I had been staying after school since I was on the track and field team. Normally, my mom and dad would alternate between picking me up from school. However, I recall a number of weeks right before Thanksgiving, they were unable to pick me up until later in the evening, about 6 or 7 p.m. And this was because they had work all day. They even still work there today, and late hours are as expected. Because of this annoyance, I would often stay after practice and work on homework, being accompanied by some friends. However, one day I wasn't really feeling too well, and I decided to take the city bus home. In case you're wondering why I didn't take the school bus, which our high school does offer, it's because it went nowhere near my home. My home is located just out of the jurisdiction, if you will, of being a student. What I mean is the only students allowed to attend this high school were the ones within a five mile radius. If you're outside that circle, well, let's just say you weren't able to attend. That's why we used a family friend's address. Anyways, the ride home was perfectly fine and I entered my neighborhood at approximately 5.30 p.m. As it's mid-November, the sun is already set and there's only light coming from street lamps and a couple of front patio lights. I live in a cul-de-sac for your information, and my house is the one at the far end. Now, just to quickly give you a layout of my home, you enter the house, and you're immediately welcome to a living room. Straight in front of you is the kitchen. To the right of the living room is a hallway. The first door reveals a guest bedroom. Further down the hallway, heading to the left, is the restroom. Then, at the end of the hallway, is my room. Anyways, once you pass the kitchen, there is also a second living room where the back glass sliding door is located. And above this second living room is my parents' room. So, anyways, as soon as I entered my house, I walk into the kitchen so I could prepare myself a cup of noodles. I walk toward the sink, fill up my cup, and then place the noodles in the microwave. As I sit on the countertop looking at the mail, I ended up hearing something crash, followed by footsteps. I immediately turned off the microwave, and I began listening. There were still footsteps. Now, I did have an older brother living with us at the time, thus I assumed he was the one causing the disturbance. However, as I became curious, I walked over to the staircase before I ended up calling his name. Eric, you up there? What are you doing? The footsteps went silent. I can hear what sounds like talking. Hey, Eric, you gonna answer me or what? Just as soon as I finish that sentence, someone calls out to me. Hey, you, don't move. Stay where you are. When I look at my left, where the second living room and glass sliding door is located, I get the shock of a lifetime. To my absolute disgust, someone with a ski mask over their face, wearing a black hoodie, blue jeans, and brown boots. Worst of all, I see a pistol. Relax, I'm not gonna hurt you. Just do as I say, okay? I know, I know, I should have run considering there's no one to my right, which leads back to the kitchen, the living room, and the front door. But I was so frozen in fear that I couldn't move. I don't really know how to best explain it. It's like my brain was yelling at me, giving me these commands but my muscles wouldn't budge. I hate to say it, but unless you're in that sort of situation, words can't even bring to life the true nightmare. In any case, the man approaches me, pistol still waving in my direction, and tells me to walk up the stairs. Two other men walked out of my parents' room, one with a knife, another 
with a crowbar. They tell me to walk into the closet. Before I enter, I did see a couple of large duffel bags that appear to be filled with some of our valuables. Okay, hurry it up. The car is waiting in the alley. You guys got everything? I recall the one with the pistol saying to the other burglars. Yeah, let's get out of here before anyone notices. As the two leave, the one with the pistol comes up to me, and he says, Don't you dare call the cops. Consider yourself warned, kid. That firm warning, I hear him follow his partners in crime, I can then hear their footsteps grow silent. I now took the opportunity to walk over to the window in my parents' room that overlooks the backyard in the alleyway, and I see as they crawl over the backyard fence. There, sitting idly in the alleyway next to a dumpster, was a white van. Its windows were completely tinted. The side door opens, and the three who just moments earlier were ransacking my home jump into the vehicle. Just seconds later, the van takes off, disappearing into the night. I must have stood there in shock for what seemed like two minutes, but it felt like an eternity. Once the adrenaline settled, I started to cry, and I ran downstairs so that I could call 911 and get some help on the way. However, as I put my hands on the phone, my brother walks in through the front door with one of his co-workers. Sis, what's wrong? Is everything okay? My brother asks, who sees me shaking, mascara tears flowing down my cheeks and all. What happened? Are you hurt? I run into his arms as I struggle to get words out. They took everything. Who took everything? My brother asks, as his co-worker heads to the restroom to grab me some tissues. Some guys. They broke in just a few minutes earlier. You barely missed them. My brother's co-worker immediately dialed for the local police station as my brother sat me on the couch, never leaving my side. Police arrived about seven minutes later and they began taking my statements along with searching my home. Unfortunately, they had made off with a bunch of my mom's jewelry, a couple of DVD players, cash savings, video games, and even my brother's new laptop. As for who the burglars might have been, we have no clue, as they were never caught, and our items were never returned. We ended up moving less than a year later, and we never have had any problems with burglars, let alone home invasions. To this day, I will occasionally think about the experience, and I wonder, what might have happened had those burglars not have been so merciful? Almost mugged after shopping. Man, oh man, what a crazy year it's been. If you want to talk about something scary, just say the number 2020, and I'm almost positive you'll get a reaction out of someone. Now, apart from the obvious scare, you'd think this would be somewhat of an opportunity for people to come together and just overall be nice and do good things. I won't really get into anything too big, but I want to discuss something that happened to me just a few weeks after the lockdown had started. This was the first week of April. For some context, I'm a 25-year-old male living at home with my parents and my younger sister, who's 17. I was chilling at home, playing video games on the PlayStation, and my sister was in her room talking to her boyfriend on the phone. It was about 7pm, and I get a call from my dad, asking if I could go to the pharmacy and pick up his prescription, as he was running late from work, and he wouldn't be able to pick it up. I said sure, and then I walk over to my sister's room, so I could let her know I would be back in about 20 minutes. I drove over to a Target since the CVS pharmacy is inside and I grab my dad's medicine. I then pick up some Cheetos and a Cherry Coca-Cola, my favorite combination for late night gaming, and I go to pay. Anyways, so far so good, apart from the obvious long line. Now something I haven't mentioned which I'm sure y'all remember, parking lots were completely packed. I'm talking every single space. Even the sections with the red painted on the curbside were filled with vehicles. Because, as we all know, you need hundreds of rolls of toilet paper. What, are you going to build a castle or something? Sorry, I just think people can be dumb sometimes and I get fed up by that mentality. I digress. The point I'm trying to get at was I had a park in a neighborhood. And I'm talking all the way at the end of said neighborhood. 
This wouldn't really have been an issue since it was a safe neighborhood, but of course I was the one who had to deal with this incident. After I'd crossed the street light, being accompanied by some other pedestrians, I did notice two of them following me. I couldn't see their faces since they had hoodies on, but something in me was screaming to be cautious. I believe it was the moment when I could hear one of them whisper something among the lines of, Not yet, until we get into a darker spot. That's when I began to sweat and I picked up my pace. Twenty seconds of a brisk walk later, I reached the neighborhood and I say to myself that they were most likely just trying to scare me. I was overreacting and being paranoid. So when I returned to a normal walking speed for about ten seconds, everything changed when I could hear them charging. I turned back around and I could see the two in hoodies, quickly approaching with knives in their hands. My eyes widened. An adrenaline began running through my veins as I noped out of there, desperately, trying to outrun these two, who were like cheetahs running after their prey. You're only going to make this worse. Stop! One of them shouts under their breath, as I'm just moments away from my vehicle. In one quick swoop, I unlock the door with my Bluetooth key, throw the bag of medicine, Cheetos, and cherry Coca-Cola against the passenger seat, and jump inside. Just as I close the door, the would-be criminals began pounding at my window, as one of them reaches for the door handle. Thank the heavens above, it was locked. I drove out of there, I think accidentally running over one of their feet, which I didn't really feel bad for whatsoever, and I head to a nearby gas station. It's here from this safe location, I called the police station and explained that I was almost mugged outside of the nearby Target and that they needed to send someone out here to catch the two. I don't know whether or not they were actually caught, but I never heard of reports of muggings in the area. It is possible it might have just been a one-time deal, but I guess I'll never truly know. I'm sure I'll get someone who says I was a chicken for running away, but let's see you taking on two guys with knives. I don't think I very much like those odds, and neither should you. Being part of the chase. This takes place in Southern California in the 1990s. I wanted to share this after listening to the video you did about scary school stories. Although this doesn't have to do with school, I was in a way able to relate to the first one, about the Cal State Fullerton lockdown on the university that was filled with students. So anyways, I was just getting out of my internship from the dentist I worked at. I was going to Domino's Pizza to pick up some food for my family, which was a weekly tradition we always look forward to. While I drove, I was able to see and hear a bunch of helicopters flying in the sky. I knew right away it had to be some sort of chase, as it's very rare to see any sort of aerial activity in my part of town. I remember laughing and saying, <laughs> wouldn't it be crazy if I would be on TV? I spoke too soon. When I reached the Domino's, I parked right in front of the store, and then I waited for about 15 minutes as the pizza was being prepared. I remember there being a little TV in the lobby area and one other man was watching it with me. Strangely enough, I got the confirmation that I had earlier suspected, a police chase that had apparently started near LA County but had now moved to Orange County, where I was located. I recognized the freeway the car was driving on, the 91, and I saw the helicopter pan across some familiar buildings and businesses. Mind you, the chase wasn't too far off from where I was currently at. Anyways, the man who was waiting in the lobby with me eventually left, meaning it was just myself and the other three employees. I ended up taking my eyes off the TV for a couple of minutes so I could go use the restroom. It's in there the helicopters began to grow louder, alongside the police sirens. Here's the point I began thinking the chase was now off the freeway, and it had somehow made its way into the city. So I finished my business, I washed my hands, and I can hear the sirens getting louder and louder. No way that chase would have made it this close, could it? I kid you not, to this day, I will never forget it. As soon as I exit the restroom, a man runs into the store and bumps past me, causing me to fall and hit my bottom. I saw him run into the kitchen, which was followed by the cook screaming at the top of their lungs. Police officers stormed into the dominoes and I just point in the direction of where the man had gone. At this point, the employees in the back had jumped over the front counter and joined me at the storefront, where police escorted us to safety. After about a minute, police exit the dominoes and have the man in handcuffs, where there are now a bunch of witnesses standing in the parking area. 
As it turned out, the man had stolen a vehicle in Compton and led the police on a very crazy chase that I just so happened to have witnessed the ending to. Now, if you're wondering what was so scary about the entire ordeal, it's that the man had a pistol in the glove compartment. Thank goodness he never actually took it with him into the store, because I think things might have turned out a whole lot worse for not just us, but for him too. Anyways, I know this isn't your typical scary story, but I figured I'd share it with the Creepy Fox family, as I think it's a nice break from the usual tales of creeps. Edit. I've been trying to find the footage of the news broadcast here on YouTube, but I haven't been able to find it. I think in part to it being lost to time. After all, this was over 20 years ago. Any of my friends who live in the Orange County area and remember the details to this incident, it'd be great to hear from you, even though I know the chances of that are quite unlikely. Just thought I'd try. Bar fights can get pretty heated. This takes place in Mexico. For some context, I'm male, and I was 24 at the time. This was in late October of 2015, and my family and I were staying over at my aunt and uncle's house for a couple of weeks. They live in the city of Colima, which, fun fact, the state is also called Colima. So it's Colima, Colima, Mexico when you write the whole thing out. We spent the majority of the two-week vacation visiting my family and attending parties thrown by friends and relatives. The most memorable celebration had to be my youngest cousin's quinceanera. That was the first time I'd ever been to one. And let me just say, the carne asada they served was like none I ever had. It didn't feel heavy nor greasy. The spices were just right too. The salsa that accompanied it was just splendid. Anyways, this isn't about the party, nor the carne asada. One evening, my parents had gone with my aunt and uncle and cousin, the one who celebrated her quinceanera, to visit some old relatives. This left just myself and my older cousin Ricardo. For reference, he's 28. And the reason we didn't join our family was because we'd already made plans to go into town and grab dinner and get some drinks at a local sports bar slash restaurant. At about 8 p.m., we get into my cousin's truck and drive into the downtown district, which was decorated and lit up with a Dia de los Muertos theme, quite different from what I was used to here in the States with Halloween. Because the parking lot was jam-packed, we parked just a 30-second walk from the bar next to a neighborhood and soon reached the bar where we put our names on a waiting list. I won't bore you with the details of the wait as we just watched a replay of football on a large screen. And I'm talking about the international version, not the American version. After almost 35 minutes of waiting, we get our names called and we take a seat at a two-person table. Fast forward to after the food and drinks. We head to the back of the bar that featured another packed room containing pool tables, bowling, and some arcade machines. We looked around the crowded room of about 50 patrons and saw one of the pool tables was empty. Ricardo and I decided to play a couple of rounds of billiards, considering we were already here and had nothing else to do. Ricardo started first, hitting the striped ball, leaving me with the solid colors. As we started taking our turns and adjusting our angles of hitting, the pool table next to us, which had just been cleared of patrons, was once again occupied by a couple of men. Both of them had arrived with large glasses of beer and began playing and laughing. Unfortunately, it seemed that one little mistake on my end would turn this fun and exciting evening into a complete nightmare. As I adjusted myself to take the finishing shot of the game, my pool stick ended up bumping into something. I took one look at my rear thinking I'd hit the accompanying pool table, but I see it had hit one of the men, and worst of all, his drink had spilled all over his clothes. This was going to go down one of two ways. Number one. He would have been like, that's my fault for not paying attention, you're good, and that would have been the civil response. But then of course there's a reaction number two, I'm going to teach you a lesson, and by lesson, I'm sure you already know what I mean. To absolutely no one's surprise, I see this man's face turn completely red. He comes up to me and immediately pushes me, causing me to hit the side of the pool table. You spilled my drink, you gonna pay for it kid? He says, as a combination of vulgarities and other words I can't repeat here are uttered out of his mouth. Look man, it was an accident. Do you think I would really purposely spill your drink? 
That's totally uncalled for. I get where the guy was coming from. I'd hate to have my drink spilled on me. It happened once to me, but I was very cool about it. After about 10 seconds of awkward staring and us just standing still, the man pushes me again. This time I'm on the verge of wanting to fight back, but this guy was way taller than me. For my height, I'm relatively short. I'm 5'11", a scrawny 170 pounds. This guy was from my best memory, 6'2", or 6'3", about 250 plus pounds. There was no chance I was going to fight him. Well, my cousin, a more intimidating 6 foot, 230 pounds of muscle, comes up to the man and tells him to chill and that we'll get a bartender to give him another drink. Something we clearly didn't want to do, but we were being the better men. The guy looks at Ricardo and I, before eventually walking away with his buddy. Sorry about that, cousin. You good? Sometimes all you need to do is just stand up to these punks. 90% of them are just filled with hot air and won't really do anything. Let's get going. I'll take you somewhere else. I agreed. And about 10 minutes later, we make our way to the front of the restaurant and let the host know that there was a guest being violent and rude. We give him details and the host says he saw someone matching the description storming out of the bar with another guest in an apparent fit of rage. Now thinking the danger was finally laid to rest, we begin walking back to the truck laughing at how silly the entire incident was. Those laughs would be shortly lived, when out from nowhere, we hear a bunch of loud footsteps approaching. Hey you two, get back here. I'm not done with you guys. We turn back and we see it's Mr. Spill Drink Man, except now he's got of all things a knife, and so does his buddy. You made a fool of me in that bar. Now I'm going to teach you a thing or two about respect. Time went into slow motion as I stood there in fear, watching the two in this drunken rage begin charging at us like lions. I recall all the sound around me going quiet, being replaced by my heartbeat and heavy breathing. When it seemed I was toast, I recall my cousin yell my name as he grabs my arm and we start to run. My hearing then returned. I'm now laser focused on the police who had just shown up at the bar. I didn't even have to say a word because the two officers just run past us and chased the two with the knives. They got them without any further altercation, thank goodness, and Ricardo and I soon joined the crowd of onlookers as we watched the men get placed in the back of police cruisers. We got questioned and we did give a statement. But other than the scare and the adrenaline rush, that was pretty much the end of it. It wasn't until a week later, back when I was in the States, that I talked with Ricardo over Xbox Live, and he told me how the police got there. Apparently, after the spill drink scene and when the men exited the gaming room, one of the patrons at the bar recalled seeing a man messing with a knife. That's when he called for police and told them there appeared to be an impaired individual with a blade. It just so happened the officers got there just as we got chased, and that impaired man was the same guy along with his friend. Quite the coincidence, but a coincidence I'm very thankful for. Who knows what might have happened had it not been for the help. So anyways, that's my story. A word of advice, if I may. Avoid playing at pool tables when the room it's located in is jam-packed with patrons. The last thing you want happening is some creep coming after you because you spilled their beverage. Avoid cheap motels. This was in early 2013 when our house was having termite extermination. It all started when we noticed termites showing up in all parts of the house, on the floors, on the patio, and even the restroom. It was bad, and we didn't even have any sort of warning. It was like one day nothing the next morning, bam. Anyway, since my wife and I are cheap, we stayed at this motel that's just a couple of blocks from my neighborhood. It's the kind of motel where a lot of homeless people like to hang out in the evenings, but 99% of the time they mind their own business. Also, with rooms only being $30 a night, having the convenience of checking up on our house and only having to stay for two nights wasn't really a bother. During the day, my wife and I were out window shopping, eating, driving around the city, 
and hanging out at this really cool arcade slash bowling alley that was called Round One. It wasn't until the second night of our motel stay that things would take a turn for the downright nightmarish. It was 7pm and my wife and I had just returned from a full day of fun. We stopped by a pizza hut to grab some food and then drove and parked outside our home just so we could check up on things. Everything looked good. We then walked 5 minutes to the motel and settled in for the evening, watching a movie and enjoying our dinner. Fast forward to about 1 in the morning. I had just woken up from a pretty bad dream and I was struggling to get back to bed. All of a sudden, I ended up hearing a doorknob jingling. I looked to my shoulder and I noticed my wife was missing. I laid there for about 5 seconds and I made the assumption she had gone outside to get some fresh air. However, I also noticed light coming from the restroom. I put two and two together and I realized she was in there. That still doesn't explain however who was jingling the doorknob. Well, I wouldn't have to wait too long, because, no joke, the door opens. I guess I should have mentioned that this motel is cheap for a reason. It lacks most features fancier motels and hotels have on offer. This motel was the kind where in order to open the doors, you weren't given a fob key or needed to type in a code on a lock. No, this hotel actually used keys. That meant if someone was smart enough, they could technically pick the lock. Or even worse, you might get a lock that doesn't close properly. Well, I laid there in bed, shaking and sweating, watching as the door slowly pries open, and the light from the moon begins to flood the living space. Standing at the doorframe is someone wearing a red bandana that's covering the lower half of their face. I am also able to see a small pocket knife. My protective husband mode then went into full effect, and I immediately jumped out of bed. I told this man to leave. He sort of just stood there for a number of seconds, as if he didn't understand what I had just said to him, before he begins to get closer. Well, what was I going to do? He's got a knife, and all I have is my training from when I used to serve in the Marine Corps. Better than nothing. Honey, stay in the bathroom, and wait until I tell you it's safe. I hear my wife respond back, being muffled by the bathroom walls, and she's just as confused as me. I'm warning you, back away. One final warning, but the man continues. I laid the smack down, if you will, not only disarming the man, but getting in a few punches while I was at it. The guy didn't stick around to fight. He booked out of the motel, tucking his tail between his legs, and then tripping on the flight of stairs. Immediately, I got on the phone and called the front desk where one of the employees came to check up on my wife and I. We told him about what happened, and what we discovered was truly shocking. The front door doesn't lock properly. Well, what kind of garbage is that? Either way, we got into contact with the police, but sadly, they never did find who broke into our motel room. I really don't have a clue as to what this person's intentions truly were. Why break into a motel room with a blade? And why attempt opening random doors? We never got answers. Thoughts? Anyways, we learned a very valuable lesson that night. If you got the money, don't be cheap. Stay at a better location. Better yet, if you have family that's willing to let you stay for a couple of nights, take them up on the offer. I promise. No, I guarantee. You'll save yourself all the headaches. Crazy Alaskan Wilderness Encounter If you've ever been in camping, then chances are you're quite familiar with the tent etiquette. That's what I call it, at least. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say you're going camping for the weekend. You try to find a nice little spot to relax at. But before you make your discovery, you find something else. A tent. Now, you're not just going to walk up to that tent and knock or zip it open. Instead, you should call out to said tent and make your presence known. That or just walk away. The last thing you want is to wake up some grumpy camp goers. A couple of friends of mine found out the hard way when this grumpy grandpa jumped out of a tent with a shotgun. Oh, you gotta love it. This was actually during May of last year, and my girlfriend Madison and I went camping in northern Alaska, outside of Fairbanks. We chose to camp in our RV because last time we went camping via tent, we had a close call with a grizzly friend. 
The bear didn't actually bother us and didn't come too close, but the scary experience acted as a reminder of just how unpredictable the wilderness can be. Anyways, we parked by this beautiful river that gave us a wonderful view of mountain range, where at the top you could see the last little remnants of snow for the season. It would be at least five to six months until the snow returned, but for now we could look forward to the hours of sunlight. Something else we became aware of was a tent that to my best estimate was located a 30 second walk from where we currently set up shop. As I mentioned in my intro about tent etiquette, my immediate reaction was to call out our presence and let the individual or individuals know we wanted to camp in the area. Yes, we could have chosen another spot as my girlfriend insisted we find some other place, but I'm also insistent and I wanted to stay here. Hey, anyone in there? Hello, I yelled out, being met with the sounds of the breeze above me. As I got a little closer, I noticed the tent was ripped up and in no condition to be used. With a quick breeze, the tent lifts up ever so slightly, and apart from some debris, it was pretty much empty. Nice, we would have the place to ourselves. Over the course of the next few days, we alternated between backpacking, fishing, sightseeing, and just lazying around the campfire. I honestly can't explain how easy it can become to get lost with the sounds of nature. It's unlike any video or movie you'll ever see on TV. It's so quiet and peaceful out here. Any sort of disturbance such as the sounds of a car engine can be heard easily as it cuts through the sound barrier. Madison and I were surprised to find ourselves in quite the unpredictable situation. It was night number three and we would be heading back home the following afternoon. We had caught a couple of salmon and we were enjoying our meal just listening to the radio and relaxing with a couple of cold ones. Out of nowhere we began hearing tires and even an engine. As I turned my attention from the campfire to the woods, we are joined by a jeep, a pretty beat up one if I might add. Seconds later, a man jumps out of the front seat with a hunting rifle and makes his way over to Madison and I. Judging by his facial expression and his strut, it had appeared he was angry. I told my girlfriend to wait in the RV as I get up and put my hand against my belt, where I had a concealed 1911. What are you two doing in my campgrounds? No one else is allowed to camp here unless they have my permission. The man raises the rifle and then proceeds to tell me to explain my presence. Look. We had no clue there is no one here. We don't mean to cause any trouble. From man to man, I just want to apologize for anything we might have done. We genuinely had no clue this area was off limits, let alone your spot. We'll leave. Just give us a second. I'm pretty much standing there expecting to meet my demise, but after 10 seconds of staring, that honestly felt like an eternity, the man lowers the rifle and proceeds to walk back to his jeep. I then watched as he backed up and parked next to the tent I mentioned earlier, the one that appeared to be abandoned. What are you waiting for? Can I move on? The man yells. I snap out of my hypnosis of fear, grab a bucket of water and throw it on the campfire. I then quickly pick up the radio and a couple of our pillows and blankets and we proceed to drive out of there. To make matters worse, the crazed man followed us until we reached the dirt road we had originally arrived on where he finally decided to turn back and drive the way in which he came from. We haven't been back there since the incident, not that you can really put a blame on Madison and I, but we do wonder what the big idea was. Was he perhaps hiding something that we didn't see and he was afraid we would stumble into it? You'd think if that were the case he would have taken us out, but he didn't. What do you guys think? He was on the news. This was in the late 1990s when I just purchased my first home. My girlfriend of five years had moved in with me and we enjoyed the peace and quiet that rural Montana had to offer. My home is a single story with two bedrooms, bath, kitchen, and living room. Not really important to the story, other than the little detail that we have a huge backyard. That backyard eventually backs up into a forest. Remember that forest because it's going to play a role later in my retelling. I worked as a security guard for a major grocery store warehouse. 
that saw me working on average 8 to 12 hours in the evenings. This normally meant my girlfriend, now wife, and myself had conflicting schedules. However, we did have Sundays together, so it wasn't all too bad. Well, after some time, we decided to adopt a beautiful Newfoundland that we named Annie that kept us company any time one of us was home. Annie was the sort of Newfoundland that stood by your side no matter what it be. She would lay next to you when you would watch TV, follow you anywhere you went, and even cried when one of us left for work. She was pretty much like a daughter. Annie was also very protective of my wife and I. I'm sure any dog owners know that dogs have a tendency to bark at strangers. It's still something to this day I have a hard time trying to figure out, but it's like they can sense the true evil in individuals. We as human beings do have these sorts of senses, but they're often very minimal, and by the time something bad happens, it's usually already too late. Well, here's what happened one evening when I'd called off of work because of a fever and my wife still wasn't home. It was approximately 5 in the afternoon and i just woken up after sleeping most of that day. Annie laid peacefully beside me, licking her paws and playing with one of her toys. Considering my fever was gone, I got up and headed to the kitchen so I could warm up some soup my wife had left me. Annie follows me and I prepare her dinner as well as we sat in the kitchen watching the television. About 10 minutes later, Annie walks over to the kitchen door and starts whining, indicating she needed to use the restroom. I grab the leash from the counter and just as I'm about to open the door, I hear what sounds like the garbage bins tip over. We actually have this problem with opossums and raccoons and it's fairly common to stumble into these little furry creatures. It's not that I have an issue with them. Hey, little guys gotta eat too. But they're very messy. In any case, as soon as the door opens, Annie wastes not even a moment, pushing and leading me toward the side of our home where the garbage bins were at. Instead of stumbling into one of our little friends, we encounter a big friend that's trying to open one of my windows. A man in a hoodie. Excuse me, sir. Can I help you? Annie starts to bark as the man does a complete 180, running off into the woods. Talk about weird and creepy. Fast forward a couple of weeks later and my wife and I are in the living room watching the local news. After a feel-good story of a dog saving the day, the news host then talks about the police catching an armed burglar. Not really anything that stands out other than a score for the good guys. Until they showed his mugshot. My jaw dropped. The man on screen was the same man who I encountered two weeks ago that had been trying to open my window. Apparently, he had been wanted and was connected with a string of home burglaries. I still wonder to this day, had he been armed that evening? I guess I'll never know the answer. But I still believe I've seen this huge Newfoundland with a facial expression that read, I'm closer and I'll take a bite out of you, was enough to get this guy to back away. So that's the end of my story. A good ending. Thanks for listening. I'm an artist myself. This happened to me last year. For reference, I'm female and I was 23 years old. It was my day off from school and I was bored in my room waiting for a delivery. I had ordered a brand new drawing pad that I had been saving up for for a few months. At about 11am, I got a knock at the door. It's the UPS guy with my delivery. I quickly signed off for it and got to playing with my brand new toy. After about two hours, I took a break and went to do some grocery shopping. In the meantime, I will let my drawing pad charge. Fast forward to getting back home, I decided instead of spending the rest of my evening in my room, being distracted by my parents hosting a get-together, I wanted to go to the park where I wouldn't be bothered. Therefore, I packed a sandwich and some chips and I drove about 10 minutes to a park I used to go to. Unfortunately, it had been quite a while since I had been there. It was currently closed having some construction done. There went my idea for some fun. Well, it's not like this is the only park. I got on my phone and quickly searched for some parks and discovered a park I had never been to before. It was about a 15 minute drive, but apparently it had a huge lake. When I got to the park at about a quarter past five, it was relatively empty. I did see a young couple with a dog and a few fishermen, but that was it. Perfect. 
if you ask me. I park and took the first bench I could find and proceed to eat my sandwich and look at the lake. There were ducks and geese swimming, and even a couple of turtles sunbathing. Once I was done eating, I took out my drawing pad and started to draw out the scenery. About 20 minutes later, I heard footsteps approaching me. Since I was so focused on my drawing, I didn't really pay attention to who it might have been. Not until I feel the bench move. This is when I looked up from my screen and I noticed this man staring back at me. Hi there. G good afternoon, sir. I say nervously as he continues to stare at me and then at the drawing pad. What are you drawing? He asks, grabbing my drawing pad and bringing it closer to him. Excuse me, but could you maybe not grab things that aren't yours? I'll show you, chill. He lets out a chuckle and apologizes, before complimenting my drawing, saying he's an artist himself. That's pretty cool. I got a bunch of art supplies back in my place. I don't really use them anymore. I've been looking to get rid of them. Maybe you'd be interested. Let's just say on the off chance he was genuine. There was no way I would just accept a gift from a stranger I just met. Nah, I'm good. All I need is this thing I got in my hands. I appreciate it, though. Without saying a word, he gets up and leaves. And as he's walking away, I hear him mumble something along the lines of, Fine. You want to play hard to get, don't you? Excuse me? I yell back, challenging his remark. But the man just continues to walk away. I did consider leaving at that point, but if I did, I would be the loser. I wasn't going to let this complete random scare me away. Well, I watched him as he walked next to the restrooms, and he took a seat at one of the benches. Another man appeared that I hadn't noticed before, and the two men took a seat together and started talking while staring in my direction every couple of minutes. It was the sort of stare that told me they might be planning something. I know, I should have just left at that point, but I never did. Another 20 minutes go by and I'm still drawing while looking up toward the men every two or so minutes. I lost sight of them eventually, and I assumed they finally left and gave up on their intentions. It was now beginning to get dark, and I finally decided it's time to head back home. I text my mom I'd be on the way and then put my drawing pad into my backpack. Here's when things got scary. I am a few feet from my vehicle when I noticed a white van with its windows tinted parked just behind mine. It wasn't there when I had originally gotten there. That's why I ignore it, and I'm about to reach into my pocket for my keys to open the car, when all of a sudden, the doors to the van open. It's the guy from before, along with his buddy and both of them have these huge smiles across their face. Hey there, guys. What's up? I say in the most nervous tone imaginable. Both men look at each other, then back at me, and begin to walk closer. I noped out of there, screaming at the top of my lungs, trying to get the attention of one of the fishermen still in the park. You'd be surprised, but these guys were so dedicated they actually followed me back into the park. Well, only just a bit past the entrance. Luckily, I do manage to grab the attention of a fisherman and notice the footsteps go silent for a brief moment. I turned around ever so slightly and watched as the two men exit the park. I was now joined by the fisherman, where I see the men get into their van and drive away. I was shaking, on the verge of crying, as the fisherman begins to ask me what had just happened. I give him the TLDR and he does admit he saw the first man sit with me at the bench, but he thought he was someone I knew. <laughs> Definitely not. Anyways, I did report the incident, but as I wasn't paying attention to the license plate, I wasn't really able to provide many details other than the white van and the dark windows. I haven't been back to the park since that afternoon, and I truly wonder what would have happened had the park been empty. I have nightmares, just imagining that outcome. Hey there everyone, welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. If you did, make sure to leave a thumbs up. Make sure to leave a comment telling me what you all thought. And of course, if you haven't already done so, make sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell beside it. That way you, yes you, 
will be notified of any and all future uploads here on the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. Also, if you have a story you want to share with me, then please do use the email tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Lately, there hasn't really been many submissions. Uh, actually, the stories that were featured today were the only ones I've received in a little over three weeks. So again, if you guys want more scary stories, make sure you're sending them in because I definitely would like to do some more videos, especially for Halloween, which is uh, it's coming up pretty soon. Now I know, I know the biggest question. Where have I been? Well, I haven't really gone anywhere, actually. Um, I've been pretty active on my other social media, but uh, if you're not following me on my other social media, long story short, I ended up getting a lumbar tear in my lower back. Um, it's a part of the muscle in the lower back. Uh, essentially, to wrap it up, um, I couldn't uh, sit down for long periods of time, bending, uh, even laying down, even going to use the restroom. Hmm, that was uh, not fun. Uh, it's about a 4 to 12 week recovery time. It's about two weeks now since I got it. Um, I'm still recovering. Uh, it's still kind of hard to do certain stuff, but for the most part, I'm feeling a lot better. But yeah, that was the reason I couldn't upload because it was uh, really hard to sit down for long periods of time. And uh, just recording these eight stories took me about a week just because I had to get up like every like five to 10 minutes to stretch because my back, <laughs> it was not cooperating with me. But there was that. There was also the unfortunate news that uh, myself and 28,000 other Disney cast members got that um, we were essentially let go. Um, that's a whole nother story there. It's pretty sad, you know. Um, it's not too fun, but uh, hey, you know, we're going to continue on here on the Creepy Fox. Uh, videos aren't going to be stopping here. I'm going to be doing my best to be providing you all with uh, new videos, even though I know I got all that stuff behind the scenes. But uh, like I said, there is still more on the way. Now, apart from there uh, not being uh, Scary Stories uploads, that was my knee, if you didn't hear it, <laughs> that little crack. Um, I've actually been working on this awesome live action slash 2D animation video. Again, if you're following me on Instagram, you've been kind of seeing a sneak peek of that. It's going to be a sort of uh, little scene of Halloween's trick or treat. It's going to involve my three characters, Aria, Tiana, and Caesar visiting my house for a trick-or-treat and I'm going to be interacting with them. Uh, I can't speak. I'm going to be interacting with them. It's a really fun. I've already filmed the live action elements. Uh, all that remains is just to do the animation and the voice actresses are going to be doing their lines for Aria and Tiana. And uh, I'm pretty excited. Uh, definitely, like I said, if you have not checked out the sneak peeks, go to my Instagram right now, give me a follow and check it out. But um, let's see, what else, what else? Um, just, again, like I said, uh, make sure you're sending in stories. I would like to do some Halloween episodes this month, so if you have a Halloween story, whether it be trick-or-treating, whether you be going to a spooky haunted house, or whatever it is, uh, make sure to share it with me. Also want to go ahead, of course, say thank you to all of you for being so patient with me. I know it was a while. I want to say thank you to all my channel members who have been supporting me through this time. Especially right now, your support means the world, considering, you know, uh, all the behind the scenes. So if you want to support, again, you can join the channel memberships, you can buy the merch, or simply put, you can just watch the videos. That's the beauty, is that you can support me, and all you got to do is just watch the videos. So I was going to do comments with Creepy, but I don't want to delay this video any longer. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to get this video out as soon as I can. Um, today, as I'm recording this right now, it's a Friday. Uh, channel members, you'll be getting this today on Friday. And then tomorrow, probably morning or mid-afternoon, it'll be available for everybody else. But anyways, uh, I'll catch you guys all next time. Again, uh, please make sure to go follow me on my other social media because I'm a lot more active there and I'll be posting more updates there. But um, until next time, I'm hoping to get you guys a Halloween episode. I'll see you guys soon. Take care.